In Module 1, we looked at the global extreme points and the first order conditions for extrema. In this module, we'll examine local extreme points and the second order derivative test for local maxima and minima. Local maxima and minima are local peaks and valleys in the value of the function. We compare the value of the function at a point to other nearby values. In this diagram, while d1 and b are the global minimum and maximum respectively, in this diagram, d1 is the global minimum and b is the global maximum. On the other hand, c1, c2 and b are all local maxima and a, d1 and d2 are local minima. Here we have a formal definition of a local extreme point. We see it's similar to the definition for a global extreme point, except the interval that we're interested in is a sub-interval of the whole domain. Finding local extreme points is a very similar procedure to finding global extreme points. Again, the difference is the interval we choose, either the whole domain for global extrema or a smaller interval within the domain for local extrema. We have a first derivative test for local extreme points. If C is a critical point, that is, f prime x at C is equal to zero, then we look at how the first derivative changes around that point C. If the first derivative, f prime x, is greater than zero below C and less than zero above C, then C is a local maximum. If the first derivative is negative below C, and positive above C, then C is a local minimum point. Of course, if the sign of the first derivative doesn't change over that subinterval, then we don't have an extreme point. Let's look at that diagrammatically. We can apply the first derivative test to the internal stationary points. First C1. Below C1, the slope is positive. Above C1, the slope is negative. And we see we have a local maximum. Looking at, say, d2, below d2, the slope is negative. Above d2, the slope is positive. And we have a local minimum. For a point somewhere in between, say, d1 and c2, I might call that point f, we see below f, the slope is positive. Above f, the slope is positive. The slope, the first derivative, doesn't change as we go from points below f to points above f. In example 4, we have this cubic function. First, we want to find all the stationary points and then look at how the sign of the first derivative changes around those points. We have our cubic function. The first derivative is f prime x will equal 1 third x squared minus 1 third x minus 2 thirds. We can simplify that. 1 third into x squared minus x minus 2. Our first order conditions then. We set the first derivative f prime x equal to 0. Well, that implies that uh, 1 third x squared minus x minus 2 is equal to 0. That implies x squared minus x minus 2 is equal to 0. We can find the roots. We can substitute into our quadratic equation and solve for x. And so our stationary points are x1 equals minus 1, x2 is equal to 2. Let's use a sign diagram to see how the first derivative changes around those points. We found the roots of our quadratic, so we can factorise the first derivative. We have our number line for x. The coefficient of x squared, one third, is always positive, so we can disregard that. We look at our two factors for the first derivative. Combining these two factors, we get our sine diagram for the first derivative. So from minus infinity to minus 1, the first derivative is positive. It's upward sloping. From minus 1 to plus 2, f prime x is negative. And then from plus 2 to plus infinity, the first root is positive. So let's see what's happening to fx, our function, around these stationary points. Around minus 1 to the left, 
f prime x is positive and then it becomes negative after minus 1. We'll have positive and negative. And so we'll have a local and so we'll have a local maximum. Around plus 2 or below plus 2 the slope is negative. Above plus 2 the slope is positive. So we'll have a local minimum. We see that the first derivative changes sign at the stationary points. Since the second derivative tells us how the first derivative changes, this leads us to think about a test involving the second derivative. Let's look at what happens to the second derivative here. At x equals minus 1, the first derivative is going from positive to negative, therefore the second derivative must be negative. At x equals 2, the first derivative is going from negative to positive, therefore the second derivative must be positive. The second derivative test is also known as the second order conditions, given that we have a twice differentiable function and a stationary point at x equals c, then if the second derivative is negative, less than zero, that stationary point is the local maximum. If the second derivative is positive, greater than zero, then the stationary point is a local minimum. We'll deal with the case when the second derivative is zero in the final module, module three. Before we put the second derivative test into practice, let's look at a historical example of why it's important. Consider the case of the B2 bomber. Here we have a B2 stealth bomber. These are mighty machines, and in 1977 dollars, they cost about $750 million each to produce. Note the unusual flying wing shape. Many factors affect the design of an aircraft. An important characteristic of aircraft, particularly military aircraft, is how far they can fly. There's a relationship between range and where the volume of the plane is distributed, either in the fuselage or in the wings. It's reported by Mansfield that the design of the B-2 bomber is flawed. The engineers who selected the flying wing configuration found stationary points in the range volume function. Here we have a schematic diagram of the range volume function. These engineers assumed the stationary point was a maximum. However, they didn't check the second order conditions. Mansfield claims that the flying wing design is actually a minimum for the range volume function. This is probably the type of mistake you gloss over on your CV. In our simplified version of the range volume function, we have two stationary points, a maximum range, the one they were looking for, and a minimum range. For the interval around the minimum, the function is convex, and the second derivative is positive. For the interval around the maximum, the function is concave, and the second derivative is negative. We can see this more clearly if we plot the graph of the first derivative. We have our function there. We have our first derivative then. At the minimum, the first derivative goes from negative to positive, and at the maximum point, the first derivative goes from positive to negative. Let's return to our cubic function example and look at the second order conditions. Here we have our cubic function. The first derivative was one third times x squared minus x minus two. And so the second derivative will be one third times two x minus one. Next, we want to evaluate the second derivative at our stationary points, x equals minus one and x equals two. At x equals minus one, the second derivative will equal, well we plug minus one into our function here, so that equals minus one. The second derivative is negative, so we'll have a local maximum. At x equals two, the second derivative is equal to well, one third, two times two minus one is so equal to plus one. The second derivative is positive, so we'll have a local minimum. We see those points on the graph to the left. X equals minus one. We have a local maximum. To the left of X equals minus one, the slope is positive. To the right, it's negative. So the second derivative must be negative. We have a local minimum at x equals 2. To the left, the slope of the function is negative. To the right, it's positive. We're going from negative to positive, so the second derivative must be positive. We have a local minimum. 
Now go to example 6 where we'll work through the process of finding and classifying global and local extreme points.